Well, I want to first of all uh, thank everyone for your prayers last week. I had a revival at St. Paul and had a wonderful spirit. God really moved. But I heard some really good news that you guys had a really good study last week. And I want to thank Philip Seats for that. The only trouble is, as we post these uh, videos online, it wasn't, we didn't get the recording of it. Uh, so what I'm going to do today, uh, it, we're, we're going to move ahead. We're going to jump ahead to the, the 11th uh, discipline, which is on evangelism, loving God by telling others about Jesus. So here is what we're going to do. The interesting thing, and this is how God moves. When God starts a wave, if I found the best thing to do is to surf that wave, ride that wave. So what we're going to do, Philip, he did a study on individual evangelism. And the discipline that uh, I'm going to cover is corporate evangelism. How we as a church uh, together can do evangelism. So, so that we didn't hit, get his good looking mug on camera, we're going to ask him to first of all come tonight and share uh, for a few moments, kind of give us the, the recap of what the lesson was. Uh, last week and then uh, then after he gives us the recap of, of the lesson that he had last week uh, then we're going to move into uh, the corporate evangelism how we as a church need to focus on that so we're going to ask brother Philip if you will come and kind of give us a recap of last week's lesson as if you didn't suffer enough now you have me for a second time <laughs> the uh, portion that we did do you have the powerpoint up here or to leave what you got going just leave what you got okay. uh, we studied individual evangelism uh, the main thing that we wanted to cover about that was that it just evangelism in its definition itself is the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching and personal witness Christian it doesn't say any other deities or any other type of religion it is specific to Christian and that the great commission that was given to the disciples was given to them to come and go witness to all persons and not only a witness to those people but to teach them how to witness and how to teach others so that this would be something of a teach the teacher uh, we go to classes all the time uh, at work where they will teach one person to train the rest of the group and when you have you know several thousand employees such as the city does you cannot have two trainers to train thousands of people. It's just like when we were talking about how could they expect those 12 people to evangelize to 300 million at that time. There was no way to do it. So the way that you do this is you train the trainer. You go out, you find people that you know can do the work, and you instill in them the lessons, the knowledge, and the message that you need to be delivered, and you give that to uh, those people they take it out and they do the same thing. 12 times 12, it's 144, times the next 12, times the next 144, times the next 144, and you easily reach a mass very quickly. Instead of sending out one or two people to do it all, you have to increase your multitude, especially as growing times, the population of the earth has continued to grow. So we had to reach more people. So we had to not only instill that in others but we had to instill it in the future generations so they had to begin start teaching their children and, to, and passing it down the same way that we do anything that we want to be remembered we pass it down and this is something very important so we made sure that we pass this down um, we talked about being in their shoes being in their sandals as it was if he came in and asked us would, what would we be willing to give up you know, would we be willing to leave all of our land, all of our, our sheep, our cows, anything that we had at that time, whatever dynasty that we had, would we be willing to give it up and walk away from family, from friends, from everything to go do his work? 
And most of us, you know, said that that was something that would be really hard to do. And we, comp and we discussed the main reason that we have those type of doubts is because the number one reason why people don't evangelize. And what was the number one reason why they don't? Fear. Fear. There's fear of being turned down. There's fear of not knowing. The fear of being inadequate, that you are not the type of person that can go out and spread the word. That you are not the type of person that someone will take serious. That you can be um, harmed, or at least your feelings can be hurt. Um, but the, the thing that we talked about also is there's so many ways to overcome the fear. But the main reason that we should overcome the fear is because should we be more afraid of man or God's wrath? God told us, woe unto me if I do not spread the gospel. He said, you will have to answer to me if you do not spread the gospel. He has told us that is something. This is a chore. This is something He has put us on earth to do. And it is something that He has told us. It is our legacy. It is a chore. It is an assignment for us to do. And for those of us in the working world, you know, if you don't do what you're supposed to do at work, there's some type of punishment usually. And that is the thing. And the main punishment is... If you do not evangelize, you may not get to see the person that you thought of and that you loved or that you could have witnessed. You may not get to see them again. I talked about how the graveyard, how we've cracked the earth so many times over hundreds of years and put people in this earth back here and how we want to see those people again. We cried when they left because we thought we would never see them again. Well, we won't on earth. But if we evangelize and we do what we're supposed to and we treat others the way we're, we're supposed to be treated and that we do what we're supposed to, we can answer with a pure heart, Lord, I knocked on doors. I did what I was supposed to do. Not all of them answered. Some of those doors were slammed in my face. It doesn't matter your results as much as your intentions. And you get an A for effort. God gives you an A for effort. As a matter of fact, He gives you a mansion in heaven for effort. It doesn't take success. You don't have to worry about succeeding. It'd be nice. It's always nice to succeed. But our desire to succeed is not really His desire to succeed. He already knows what these people's responses are. He wants to know what your response is as to whether or not you're going to go out and do what He has asked you to do. We talked about why should we? They said in Paul, Paul said in Romans, I am a debtor. I owe this debt to others. Each one of us owes it to every other person we could ever come in contact with, whether it be on Facebook, whether it be social media of any type, or whether it be walking in the street or in the church. We owe it to the other people of this world to save them from this world. I asked you the question last week, how would you feel if you knew that in my hands right here, I held your salvation and I never gave it to you? If I just walked past you and walked out this door because I was afraid you wouldn't like what I said. Your salvation in my hands. And that's what we have. It may not be the salvation that we walk up and I hand it to someone and they take it and then they become a preacher. That's not usually the type of things we're going to see. But I walk up, I give them the word. What they do with it's on them. But I have to give it to them. It is a present that was given to me by my family, by my friends, and by the people that I have been surrounded with. And it is a gift. It is okay to re-gift. We can't give this, but this is something that it's okay to re-gift. They want you to give this out. And luckily, it's something that I can give you to you, to you, to you, to you. It just continually goes on. It's like grandma's old fruitcake. There's plenty of it to go around. You know, it never ends. Finally end up throwing away some of it, but you know, it's plenty of it to go around. Another thing that we talked about is what are our fears? They're our inadequacies. They're just us. It's fear. 
And fear is in your own heart, your own soul. And mostly it's in your own mind. So you can overcome fears. And one of the main ways that we talk about overcoming fears is people always like somebody to go with them. Now that'll get a little bit more into Brian's portion of this lesson. But you take one person, all right, you're a creep at the door. You take two people, okay, now you might be a creep at bought reinforcements, but you know, sometimes one of you can get in, one of you might not, you know, but there's two knocks, there's two faces, there's two chances. You went from being 50-50 to now, you know, you're 50-50 and 50. So, you know, you, got, you each got those chances there. If you take more than that, if you take a youth group, if you take a Sunday school group, again, rub it off into Brian's area. But you're increasing your chances every time you go. And I can go down, the do go down the road here and I can knock on the door and I can get it slammed in my face. June can go down there, knock on the door, he may get door slammed in his face. Mom can go down the door, she's not going to get door slammed in her face. Janice can go down there, because she's supposed to cut her hair. <laughs> they, let, they let her in. They let her in, and that's all it took. She got in the door. And then, just that one little seed. She may not see them in Huntsville Baptist Church ever. She may never hear that that person was saved or baptized. But she may plant the seed that on their deathbed, Brian Chilton gets a phone call that this person's sick and he goes and sees that person at the hospital and there before it's all eternally too late, they decide. You don't have to reap the entire benefit of everything. As I already said, you get the A for effort. But the main thing is you want to plant that seed. And rubbing it off into Brian's area again, you know, if we take multiples with us, that's the easiest way for us to overcome our fears. But we talked also about how we can reach people. So many ways to reach people nowadays. Those 300 million people that were around Jesus' time around then, that he sent 12 people, including himself, to go speak to 300 million people. And I think she's got a lot more friends on Facebook than I did, but she said she could reach that by hitting the, bu hitting the button on her phone. She's definitely got more friends than I got on Facebook. Uh, Brian probably could do the same. But walking, getting on their little mules and riding across the desert and stuff, how hard it was to actually evangelize back then compared to now. Nowadays, you pick up your phone, you hit a button. Like, share, whatever it is you do on Facebook. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, you know, spread things. After the session that we had last Wednesday, I saw several things from this group itself that were commenting on this. There were some verses that I had covered here that were put out and people actually used the materials uh, which made me realize y'all were not all asleep so that was always good. But we talked about sharing and spreading and immediately I saw the results of that. Now I don't expect 30, 30 more people to be in church next Sunday. It could happen. But I may not see it here, but I they're, guarantee there are probably 30 people more in churches across the world somewhere because of the efforts that were taken. It may be one in this county, maybe none in this county. It may be one in South Carolina, one in Virginia, one in California. You never can tell, but you sowed that seed, you put it out there, and we'll worry, worry about everyone else trying to reap the results. But we discussed how important it is to evangelize. And as I said, I covered individual because it all starts with individual. And it's something you can do every day. Um, most of us have our phone attached to us all the time. And I know I do at work, and it goes off constantly. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's, I don't even know what that is, delete, you know, whatever. But half the time, I'll scroll up several times a day, I'll look and I'll see something that I like where someone has told me something good. Or, please pray for this person. You know, do you see this person? This is their story. Um, this person did this for me today. And even though it may not say Jesus on it, it may not say for God, those are people acting in godly ways. And all I got to do is hit a button 
and I just evangelized to probably the six people I've got on friends. <laughs> probably more than that, probably about 60, but you know, half of them I don't know. <laughs> I just so yes. But easily, by the push of a button, I can do that. By my tone at the grocery store to the person in front of me. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of people might be seeing lately is in the drive-thrus. Have any of you seen this before? And I have received this three different times over the last year. I have pulled up to pay for my food at a drive-thru. You can tell I don't miss too many drive-thrus. I pull up, and they tell me my food's already been paid for. So the car, two cars ahead of you, or the car ahead of you, said, have a blessed day. Thank you for what you do. And I've been in uniform and not in uniform. So sometimes it may be the police thing, sometimes it's not. But people are spreading the word of God by doing what we would want done for us and what God would do for us. And they're attaching a message through a drive through person. You got the person that did it. You got the witness of the drive through person. So I guarantee he's going to turn around and say, can you believe what this person just did? He just paid for two, three cars worth of food. You know, I should have put my order on there. So now you've got all those employees there. And then you've got the people that received the gift all receiving that message right then and there. So as simple as evangelism is, and as important as it is, we don't do near enough of it. But I think we all understand the importance of it. We understand that our fears are the only thing keeping us from doing it. And overcoming our fears, that's a lot of what this world is about, what our life is about. But how many of your fears can actually hurt you? But, that friend, it's always much better. So, the world's a new portion. Let's give him a round of applause. Well, as Brother Philip said, uh, evangelism is expected. And I want to read a few passages of Scripture to you uh, just to kind of to, to, to coincide with what Philip has told us. Uh, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus told the disciples, and, and, and Philip is right, you know, 12 disciples, and what he said, it hits the nail on the head. They trained other people. Uh, those disciples took the message of Jesus. He, he invested three and a half years in these disciples. They trained other people to do the same thing that Jesus taught them to do. And so just, again, you know, you, you have, say you have 10 people, and each one of them invites one person, say invites one person to church or leads one soul to Christ, and guess what? Instead of having 10 people, you automatically have 20 people. Uh, if, if those 10 people, each individual, brought in two, I mean, you, you've tripled the number there. And so and that just shows the power of Christ and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit working through us. Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus says, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and following, uh, Jesus says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and, you know, telling them the reason behind the evangelism and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So that shows us that it starts where we are. You know, begin where we are. You know, a lot of times it's easy for us to send uh, something to a far-off land and give good news to someone way off, it's, it's easier to do that a lot of times than it is to go next door and knock on someone's door and tell them, hey, you know what? Jesus loves you. You know, and, and so it starts at home. It starts where we are and then multiplies out. And he says, you know, behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you to stay into the city to your clothed with power from on high. So there again, the power of the Holy Spirit is uh, the driving force behind our efforts. John 20, 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. As the Father sent Jesus to bring salvation into the world, so Jesus sends us out into the world uh, to tell people about the salvation found in Christ. Uh, in Acts 1, 8, here again, you said, you see, he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that's the same way as saying... You know, starting in Yakinville, going to uh, Yakin County, to the state of North Carolina, to the southeastern United States, all, and to the entire world, 
uh, that's the same type of thing being said there. So evangelism is expected by the believer. Uh, and so we also find something else. Evangelism is the purpose of the church. Jesus gave us some marching orders in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. This has been called the Great Commission. And so Jesus is telling the disciples, the group together, and in fact, this is the marching orders for in the entire church for all time. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has the authority to give salvation. The authority to preach that message has been given to us. As he's been sent forward, so he's sending us forward. And he says, go, therefore. Now, did he say, sit and hope that it happens? Or, 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 or sit and just pray that it happens? No, go, therefore. And look what he says. First of all, make disciples of all nations. First thing we see is discipleship. Making people into disciples of Christ Jesus. And that means we have to invest time in one another. Uh, we have to build up one another. Uh, we have to help one another along the Christian way. Uh, making people into disciples of Christ. Uh, there's also the aspect of evangelism, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So discipleship is critical. Evangelism is critical. Telling people about Jesus and seeing them baptized in the name of the triune Godhead. And also teaching. Look what he says. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So discipleship, evangelism, teaching, teaching other people about the truths of God's Word, building up one another, uh, and, and as Philip said, training the trainers. By the way, uh, if you take a look at some of the fastest growing churches, they have done exactly what Philip said. Matter of fact, he's already stole the line I was going to say, but that's exactly what they did. They trained people how to witness, how to take the message out, and those people saw the working of God going through their lives. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was people came to faith. They started coming to church. And in no time, people being trained how to do this went out and grew the church, or God grew the church through those people by unbelievable measures. Uh, I even heard of uh, one pastor. Uh, they implemented this. And the church grew from like 100 to now I think it's 3,000 uh, from implementing that very method. You know, see, the thing about it is, and the thing we have to understand, is that you meet people every day, and God puts people in your path. Now, I've, I've had people, and I don't mind doing this at all, so don't take this the wrong way, but I've had people say, Pastor, would you go see so-and-so? And, of course, I will, but I think it's better if, you, if whoever asks me to go goes with me, and I'll tell you why. Because if I go, they have no clue who I am. And I go knocking on their door, and maybe they're going through something, and they, they open the door, and I say, well, I'm the pastor from Huntsville Church. And they say, well, okay, well, come on in. I don't know you. I've never met you before. And I say, well, I hear you have some troubles. They say, well, how do you know that? You know, I don't know you. But if, if someone who knows them quite well goes with me, uh, that person has a connection with the person. And that person will be more likely to open up to that person as they will me whom they've never met. So God uses all of us together. And by training and developing one another into evangelists, which by the way, that's what we all really are, evangelists telling people about Christ, we fulfill the purpose of the church. Now, Philip mentioned this, and uh, this is going to kind of be of a recap for some of the things that he said. Fear is the number one reason why people do not evangelize. And I've come up with four. There may be more than this. Uh, first of all, fear number one, fear of not knowing what to say. What if I go tell somebody about Jesus and I don't know what to say? Well, by the way, I'm going to lay out a plan of attack for you tonight uh, to lead you to the three fundamentals of bringing the gospel message tonight. But the fear of not knowing what to say, well, the response to that is, one, trust in the Holy Spirit. God will give you the words to say. But secondly, know the Scripture. That's what we're supposed to do anyhow. You know, the Bible tells us that we need to meditate. Uh, the psalmist tells us to meditate upon the Word of God. Hide the Word of God into our hearts. Uh, and know our theology. Know what it is we believe. Know why it is what we believe. And if we just have the basics of Christianity down pat, know what Christianity is all about, then we're going to be better prepared to be able to know what to tell people. And you know what? If you study the Scripture and you hide God's Word in your heart, 
It's funny how the Holy Spirit will bring out a passage of Scripture at the right time, at the right place, and in the right moments. I've even had the Holy Spirit bring Scriptures to my mind that I didn't even know that I had even memorized before. Uh, that's just the power of God. And so trust in the Holy Spirit, know the Scripture, know what we believe as Christians. The second fear I find is uh, the fear of not knowing how to answer questions. And I want to tell you, give you three responses. One, it's okay not to know the answers. Just be honest. Where we get in trouble sometimes is when we get stuck, we don't know the answer, we start making stuff up. I've been there, I've done it before. We start spouting off answers. Just be honest. Just tell the person, you know what, I don't know how to answer your question at this time. Let me go look into it, and, I, and I'll come back with the answer at some point later, in the, in, later on. Also, again, knowing, knowing what you believe will help you answer some of these questions. And by the way, you're not doing this alone. I am at your disposal. Uh, you know, if, if there's something you can't find, come to me. I'll help you look for it. If I don't know the answer to it, uh, I'll keep looking to help you find the answer to the question. So there's really no need to fear if we're honest about things. Uh, the third thing we see is the fear of anger from the person with whom we're witnessing. Uh, we're afraid of how they're going to react, how they're going to respond. And I give a few answers to this. First of all, understand sometimes the anger stems from the guilt of their sin. Sometimes the anger may not be that they're really angry with you. It may be that they know what you're saying is true and they just don't want to deal with it at the time. Amen? Yeah, that's what happens a lot of times. So a lot of times the anger is not really towards you, it's towards something else. But despite that, understand that we need to show them love. Even if they do get angry, let them know that you care for them and leave the door open so that they might come back and continue the conversation with you later on. Having an online ministry, I can tell you, I've been called every name in the book. I've been called names that I didn't even know existed. And I have responded in one of two ways. One, I've gotten angry and I fired back, <laughs> which you know what, only escalated the situation. But then what I've also found the better situation is just to back off, you know, give a kind, compassionate word, and you know what, that, that stuns, that, that, that throws uh, sand upon their fire. And so they kind of chill out after that. You know, and some people will come back, and, and come back and they'll ask you certain things. Uh, so the fear of anger, you know what, it is a reality. Some people are going to get angry, but you know what, if we let fear govern our lives, we're not going to see anything done. Amen? We're not going to see anything done. Fear actually comes from the devil. God gives us courage, God gives us hope, God gives us power from on high. And so don't let fear have a stranglehold on your evangelistic efforts. And fourthly, we have the fear of broken relationships. Uh, sometimes people will fear that, you know, if I come to this person and I tell them about Jesus and they get angry with me, are they going to be my friend after this? You know, are, am I still going to have a relationship with them? Well, I just have a couple of responses to that. One. If your friendship with that person is so flimsy that telling them the truth about Jesus breaks that relationship, you didn't have much of a relationship to begin with. Isn't that true? You know, if telling them the truth about Jesus is going to break a friendship, then there really wasn't that much of a friendship there. Secondly, if you truly care for them, if you really believe what this says, and here's, and here's where the rubber meets the road, if you really believe what's in the pages of this book, are you willing to see that person spend eternity in hell? Which is the more loving thing? To tell them the truth about what's in here or to let them continue down the path leading to hell? Which is the more loving thing? Okay. Tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. It's difficult, yes, I'll grant you that. It's difficult, very difficult. But it's the most caring thing that we as Christians do. By the way, I found... Uh, was it Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller? I think it was. He's an avid atheist. And he says that if Christians really believe the, the gospel, if, he, if they really believe what's in this book, he says he wants people to tell them about the faith. And that doesn't mean that he will come to faith, but if we really believe this is true, then we should be telling people about it. We should be warning people about the consequences of rejecting Christ. So also we see that evangelism 
is outreach. And you know, there are two aspects of church life. There's outreach and inreach. Outreach are activities done to reach people outside of the church. Inreach are activities done to build fellowship within the church. Let me just tell you this. Both are absolutely important. Both are critical, in fact. But the problem is, is that a lot of times churches get out of bounds. And this is what Jack Gentry, he's a former uh, Yakin Baptist Association Director of Missions, uh, years ago, he said that most churches, in his estimation, spend 90% of their time in inreach and less than 10% of their time in outreach. Now, let's just throw some facts out here. Most of the churches in America are not reaching the lost in their community. The growth that happens in a lot of churches are, are normally by, by what's called transplants, where a person moves from one church to the next. And that's great. That's absolutely fantastic. But if our goal is to reach the lost, shouldn't we spend a lot of time in trying to see those numbers coming in the church, being individuals who've never heard the gospel? Individuals who don't have that relationship with Christ? You know, that, that's something we need to focus on. Uh, the fastest growing churches, and although the statistics show that the church attendance in America is declining, it's interesting enough to find, interesting to find that the churches that are declining are those that are far more, I hate to use the term, but far more liberal. Uh, you know, many churches that may not even believe some of this stuff, those are the ones that's in decline. Evangelical churches, churches that hold the truths of the Bible, they're actually maintaining, holding their own, and in fact even growing. Uh, why? Because they're focusing on outreach. Therefore, churches, the churches that uh, focus on outreach, they're growing. Therefore, churches need to spend more time on evangelistic outreach. By the way, Jack Gentry suggested that churches try to divide their time to a 50-50 type of thing. 50% outreach, 50% inreach. That way you minister to the people in the church and minister to the lost outside the church. So I think that's a good point. I think it's a good point that he makes. Uh, evangelism also is, it should be intentionally based. Evangelism falls in the shadows of ministry oftentimes because we'll, we'll do outreach events, but the problem is, is we're not intentional in trying to share the gospel message. We may help people, but we, we fail so oftentimes to, to put the gospel message in there somehow or some form. Uh, with activities and functions, we need to seek ways to get the gospel into the activity and or function. For instance, uh, let's just take a Thanksgiving dinner. Say we have a community Thanksgiving dinner and uh, we invite people from the community to come. Uh, maybe we can make it evangelistic by uh, asking people how God has blessed them. And somehow, or some form or fashion, get the gospel message in there. Uh, for instance, we have a thing coming up here very shortly, uh, the Trunk Retreat, the community outreach that we do here. Um, Janet brought these, and this is an excellent witnessing tool. It says, uh, these are gospel tracts, where will you spend eternity? Uh, little gospel tracts that, that lay out the message of the gospel. Now, just like Philip said, we may not know the impact of what happens by handing out these. But God does, and if we plant the seed, we never know what's going to come of it. What are some other ways that you, that you think that we can make some of the things that we do here more intentional in evangelism and sharing the gospel? And that's, and that's a good point because by coloring books, it's got the pictures there. Even if it's in a different language, they can still see the pictures. By the way, that's why stained glass windows came about. Because in the medieval, medieval ages, the literacy rate was very low, and the stained glass windows presented the gospel message so that people, when they sat down, could see the gospel message going from one side of the church to the other. It was visual in the way they demonstrated that. That's how stained glass windows came about. But very good point. Shoot, 
in their own language as well as they give them boxes. Well, so it's not just what we put in, it's what we put in their own language as well. I didn't know that. That's what's good to hear. That's very good to hear. Well, let me ask you this. How might we become more evangelistic in this community? Uh, what are some ways we can reach people with the gospel message in this community? One of the things that I Well, amen. Looking at some evangelism methods, uh, there, are, there are four different methods. In fact, there are many more we can mention. Uh, but I want to give you kind of the pros and cons to each one of these because, you know, there, there are uh, differences in, in, in these different ones. First of all, there's the personal one-on-one -on -one evangelism. And this is by far the best method. And that's sitting down with someone over a cup of coffee, one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano, uh, sitting down with a person telling them about the, the love of Jesus. Uh, the, this is the best form of evangelism. This is what the early church did. If you want to know their methodology, this was it. They went to their places of business. They went to their families. They went everywhere. They came, Every person they came across, they told them about the gospel message of Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. Now, the only downside to this is that it's the scariest version. <laughs> you know, if we talk about fears, this is the scariest version because you're seeing this person, you know, front and center. And, you know, it's, it's the most confrontational of all of these different ways. But this is the best, by far, personal one-on-one -on -one evangelism is the best method by far. Secondly, we see group evangelism. And here we think of uh, revivals and church meetings and things of this nature. Uh, like the Crusades, Billy Graham Crusades, he had those years ago. Uh, this is probably one of the easiest ways to evangelize. It's very programmed. It's easy to implement as far as getting the gospel message out there. But the problem of this is that one, it requires training. And two, it's, it's difficult to get the unchurched individual to an event like this. And so uh, it really requires a great effort by everyone coming together, praying, coming together, and bringing the you know, lost individuals to an event like this. Uh, activities evangelism. And this is what Philip was talking about. Uh, 
evangelizing by, by different activities. And this is easy to implement. You know, this is a good way to evangelize. Uh, you know, you can help someone in the process. You have a better chance of getting the lost to attend something like this. You again have a kind of a program and the support of other people going out and doing this. But the only other, the only downside is that it may be less personal and sometimes could be difficult to implement uh, depending on the circumstances. And then you have online evangelism. And this is where, uh, this is a lot of what I do online is evangelism. Uh, it's easy to engage individuals. It gives you the opportunity to think about responses because you don't have to automatically send a response at the moment it's posted. It gives you time to think about it. It's a growing opportunity as there are more and more people online. Uh, it gives you the ability to reach people that you may not ever know. And in fact, uh, the website that I'm running now, uh, last check, is getting ready to break 99,000 views in 188 nations. Uh, I guarantee you that I don't know hardly any of the people uh, who, who are coming to it. I know some of the people who are accessing it, but there are people in Kenya who, if, and there's actually a pastor in Kenya who wanted me to come preach for him. I said, well, brother, I tell you, that's going to be a long trip. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I don't know that I have the funds to, to, to be flying out to Africa, but anyhow, uh, but, uh, but, you know, I've had, you know, folks from Kenya telling me, you know, about this website, about how this blessed their hearts. The thing about it is, is, is this is a blessing because you don't know who's going to be impacted by this. But the only downside to it is that it's the least personal of all. Uh, and also... The other downside of this is if you talk about people getting aggressive, people are more likely to get aggressive behind a computer screen than they ever would be in a one-on-one -on -one encounter. So actually, you know, if, you think, if you're worried about people getting angry, it's easier for it to happen in an online environment than it is necessarily on a one-on-one -on -one environment. Um, so, evangelism. How is it done? What is it we need to bring when we talk about Jesus? The gospel presentation needs to include, at the, at the mere level, the most basic level, you need to include three points. First of all, you need to confront the problem. And what is the problem? Sin. Absolutely. Now that's where you've got to diagnose the problem before you can let people know about the salvation. Uh, you hear a couple of passages of Scripture you can use. Romans 2.12 for all have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And here's another passage of Scripture that's very important to remember. Romans 3.23. This is important to let people know, that, hey, I'm not preaching from a high horse. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes me, that includes you, that includes everybody. Ray Comfort has a tactic that, that is very applicable here. You may come across a person who says, Hey, man, I, what do you mean I'm a sinner? I'm not that bad of a person. You know, what do you mean I'm a sinner? You know, I'm not, I'm not that bad. You know, I know people who've done a whole lot worse than I have. There's a series of questions that you can use to show them the, the depth of their sin. For instance, you can first of all say, just ask them a question. Have you ever lusted? Have you ever lusted after a person? Have you ever less lusted after anything in life? And if they're honest, they're going to say, yeah, I have. Then you say to them, well, Jesus says that if you have lust in your heart, it's the same as committing adultery. Then you ask them the question. The second question, have you ever held anger in your heart towards another person? And if they're honest, they're going to say, oh, yeah, just this morning I did, or just yesterday I did. Then you say, well, according to Jesus, if you hold anger in your heart, <laughs> that would answer. if you have anger in your heart, it's the same as committing murder. And then ask them a third question. Have you ever uh, misused God's name? Have you ever blasphemed the name of God? And if they're honest, they're going to say, well, I probably have at some point in time. Then you can say, well, you know what? That's considered blasphemy. And then you ask them a fourth question. Have you ever took anything that wasn't yours, including a paper clip from work or a pencil from work? Or and you just ask you guys, anyone ever took anything that wasn't yours, a paper clip, pencil, or took it to a band or anything like that? Well, that's thievery. That's theft. 
And so he goes to say, by your own admission, you've told me that you are a lying, uh, cheating, blasphemous, stealing adulterer, murderous adulterer, by your own admission by that. And so what he goes and does from this is he says, listen, all of us are guilty of this. I'm not speaking from a high horse. I'm just saying that, that God's standards are so high that none of us could ever meet God's standards. And so then what he moves into and does is after he's diagnosed the problem, he moves into the solution, which is salvation. Now, we're all under sin. You've got to let the person know that. But then we say the solution is found in Jesus Christ because Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. So tell the person here about the love of Jesus and that despite what they've done in their life, despite the depth of their sin, that God loved them so much that He was willing to save them by dying on the cross for their sins. That through the blood of Jesus, they can have salvation. That's the second part. You, you first of all tell them the problem, you tell them the solution, and then thirdly, you move into the application, which is the reception, and you, you quote Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Ask the person quite bluntly, after hearing about the love of Jesus, the fact that Jesus loves them and wants to save them, ask them point blank, would you be willing to receive Jesus as your Savior? And there's one of three answers that they'll give you. Yes, no, or I'm not sure right now. If they say yes, you know what? Say a prayer with them. Lead them in a prayer and that uh, first of all confesses the sin, repents of the sin, receives the salvation found in Christ. Uh, you know, that's what you do. If no, then you know what? You've done your part. Accept their no and just tell them, say, listen, I still love you anyhow. If you want to talk about this, I'll be willing to talk with you about this. You know, leave the doors open for them. And if it's a maybe, do the same thing. You know, just pray with them, encourage them to not put this on a back burner, but to keep thinking about this and keep the doors open. Maybe give them your phone number or whatnot. So those are the three reactions that you'll get. Either, yeah, I'd love to receive Jesus. No, I, I'm not so sure right now. Or maybe I might do it a little bit later. So uh, really not so bad after all, is it? You know, three answers, three responses that you can get. Crew, formerly known as Campus Crew Crusade for Christ, offers the four spiritual laws uh, that you can use if you'd like to. Uh, first of all, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, John 3, 16 and 10, 10. Uh, we've all sinned and separated from God, Romans 3, 23 and 6, 23. Jesus is the only way to be forgiven of our sins, and we find that in John 14, 6, and that we must personally receive Jesus as Savior and Lord in John 1, 12. So, here again, um, we've talked about some ways that we can become more intentionally evangelistic. At this time, do you have any questions, maybe concerns, fears, or any type of questions that you have or concerns that you have uh, when it comes to evangelism that you'd like to talk about right now? Or maybe some ideas for the day. What was that now? Oh, no. <laughs> and you know what? You may not even have to go in. You know, in all honesty, you may not even have to go into that because most people will probably say, you know, they will realize, hey, I've done some things wrong in my life, but uh, yeah, I'll be fine. <laughs> And you don't necessarily have to even do that, but it kind of just... <laughs> he, he's a lot bolder than I am, I'll just because he's a street evangelist, he's a lot bolder uh, than, than what I would probably be. Well, it functions in activities. You don't have to have a big, long, And by the prayer, by the prayer you mentioned, that's an excellent way of presenting the gospel even through the prayer. You know, through the prayer, you even go through those three things that we mentioned, but that Lord we come to you and say that, you know, we realize that we're sinners, that we can receive your salvation, and go through moving through those three things. Even by saying the prayer, you can come to see me.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just to let the ladies know, what Philip is doing is when the ladies some places who ask people to write someone down that you know that, that's not actively involved in the church, but you're not really sure if they're a believer or not. You know, write down their name, write down their address, write down the contact information. And it may be just simply as sending a flyer saying, hey, we'd love to have you at church. And in that flyer, present the gospel message or maybe give them a call or something like that. If, you just, if everyone were just to sit down and think of maybe two people that you know, that you're not sure if they have a relationship with Christ or not, send them a flyer, give them an invitation. You never know what's going to come up. They may not answer, but you know what? You've done your part. You're not responsible for the reaction of the person. You're just responsible for getting the information out there. What they do with it is on them. You've done your part. So, you know, is that fair? You know, I think that's pretty fair of God to do that. You know, saying, hey, you're not responsible for what a person does. And you know what? There are going to be people who walk away. Uh, a rich young ruler came to Jesus asking how he would be saved. Jesus told him, you know what? Mark even writes that Jesus deeply loved this person and the guy walked away. And you know what? Jesus didn't come begging him, saying, you've got to come, you've got to come. He let him go. He didn't expect him to see him. So we've got to get the information out there uh, and that's, that's what we're responsible for doing. Any other ways that you think to think of that we can uh, be more intentional in our evangelism? One Yeah, I can remember. We can go on the other side. 
you know, and we could go, you know, any, any direction that the Lord leads. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> well, there's another thing that uh, some churches have done uh, that's uh, that's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I would need somebody who knew how to do this because I had no clue how to do this. But we do like a mass mailer, uh, sending out a mailer to the entire community to let you know that, hey, we're here. We got some great things going on. We invite you to church. We'd love to have you. You know, studies have even shown that 60% of people would come to church if they were just simply invited. You know, all it takes is the invitation. You know, so maybe sending out a mass mailer. Uh, Really? Christmas picture of me and my uncle, and we're both talking. We're both doing this number in the exact same pose, and I'm like, "That is just scary. <laughs> that is just scary." All right, anything else for the close? All right, for our spiritual workout challenge this week, uh, beginner level. Now, don't forget, we only have about two or three weeks left of this, and uh, and the deal is that everybody who fills out at least one. For each week, we'll have a little prize for you. Maybe a book, maybe a bag of candy. See how many people we have who will uh, we'll, uh, distribute that according to that. But the beginning level this week is to think of and write down some ways that you can become more intentionally evangelistic. I will even go a little step farther on this one. Think of some people you know that don't go to church and hand it to Philip or myself. Uh, give us some ideas of some people. Maybe we could send a phone call to them, an email, or send them a flyer or something like that. Uh, so think of someone that you could uh, minister to in that way this week. Immediate, uh, the intermediate is share the faith with someone online or by phone. Or the advanced level is to share the gospel uh, with someone in a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter. And so uh, be prepared to discuss uh, this next week. Uh, any more questions or comments before we close? Certainly, I, I, I do know I hadn't seen him in a while. I was wondering what was going on. So, absolutely. Any others? Well, if not, I'm going to ask Burl if he would to close us with a word of prayer.